Hello, and welcome to another episode of Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Dimitri Lylan, and I'm excited to have somebody from the .NET team with me, Richard Lander. Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks, this is great. Yeah, we, we'd love to have you here, and uh, we're going to talk today about .NET Core, and specifically .NET Core 2.0, Preview 2 release. So, Richard, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what .NET Core is? Because, you know, as much as we want to talk about the newest preview, that's why you're on the show today, there's probably somebody out there who doesn't know what .NET Core even is all about. Okay, um, definitely. So, um, we started this project, the .NET Core project, uh, maybe three years ago, something, something like it's that. It's been a while. Yeah. I mean, this is version 2 we're talking about of that. Yeah, and we did two versions before that, 1.0 and 1.1. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there was a development period. And um, for those of you who are familiar with the project, you know we had kind of an elongated <laughs> development period and had a few different names. So it's yeah. been about a three-year project. Um, if I think about um, what it was we tried to build, we wanted a cross-platform project. Um, we wanted to have side-by-side -side installs. We wanted a project where we could move quickly and innovate and deliver a lot of value to customers. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I think we've done that. We've yeah. done those three things. Uh, we, this is, doesn't seem quite as relevant now as it once was, but the project's all open source as well. We've said that a million times now. Yeah, and, I mean, and that was one of the biggest things that people were surprised about. We're going to build, you know, I, I think it was around the same time VS Code right, was announced as yeah. well. I don't remember who was first or second there, but two, two open source projects, two really big important projects to Microsoft. And, and with Core, like you said, right, the whole, it's going to run on Linux, it's going to run on the Mac thing. Um, you know, it's going to be super optimized. It's going to run side by side X file deployments. All yeah. of that was, was the exciting, yeah. exciting stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the the open source thing. We we felt like if we're going to do um, a Linux friendly and a Mac friendly product, it has to be open source. There's just no no other option. Yeah. Um, you know, I said I, we've said this a million times. Like now, that's just what we do every day. So every day, everyone on the team is on GitHub. Doing, you know, pull requests, working on issues, building in the open. I building mean, in the open. It's the scary, sc cool, and scary thing. Yeah, at the same when, time. when we first started, um, it was just us talking to one another. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, we definitely had some community members right from the start. Sure. Yeah, some people were there from the beginning. Yeah, but now it's completely different. Now there's this extremely constant engagement um, with the community every single day. Um, and uh, a, a big part of my job and a uh, number of other people on the team is answering their questions if they're having trouble or there's a ton of people that are actually suggesting ways to change the product. Sometimes that looks like a good direction and we go there. Sometimes it has to be altered a little bit, mm -hmm. so th that's a big yeah, part I, of it I think the, the biggest thing that I, you know, when I talk to people about what .NET Core is all about, I tell them it, it's not just any longer being built just by Microsoft, right? We have community contributions. We're accepting those contributions. Sure. It, it, is, it is kind of a cool thing to think about that anybody out there, like you, you folks out there in the audience, right? As you're, as you're working with Core, you might realize, oh, this, this function really should have always been there, right? Let me put some helper thing in there, and you could submit it as a pull request and yeah. see if the team accepts it or, or maybe gets inspired by it. You, you guys still decide what gets in or out, mm -hmm. but it's, it does work. Yeah, another part that's uh, close to what we've just been discussing is we actually have daily builds. Mm -hmm. as well. So, um, uh, and each branch actually produces daily builds. Yeah. So, um, for people who are really wanting to keep up on the bleeding edge of what we're doing, you know, you can install one build yesterday, a different build t today, and a different build tomorrow, and then, um, you know, if, if the, the issue that you, you posted finally got fixed, it got fixed today, then tomorrow morning when you wake up, you can try that build and validate that it actually was fixed. If it wasn't fixed, then you can reactivate that issue um, and say, you know, folks, uh, I don't know what it was you fixed, but it wasn't my <laughs> thing. Um, and that level of engagement was definitely not available before at all. Yeah. So that's and you, you can look, you know, as a customer, you can look behind the scenes how the code is actually running. So there's no more, there's no more secrets there. The whole library is up in the open and, and so, so is a bunch of other stuff. So ASP.NET is up there, Entity Framework is up there. I mean, everything is part of this core initiative, right? This yeah. core family <laughs> of product. Yeah, so maybe we could um, talk about something um, else, which is its relationship to .NET Framework. Mm -hmm. um, so in many ways, it's very, very similar to .NET Framework. Um, actually, most of the runtime implementation is shared between the two products, so mm -hmm. um, that's very, very similar. Um, uh, and it's uh, um, for the, f the framework libraries, 
the, most of the code base itself isn't shared, but um, the behavior is very similar, the same APIs and all that kind of thing. I think the big difference is that um, we have like uh, done a framework on over a billion machines, and so there's a ton of responsibility that comes with that to make yeah. sure that all those apps in you know hundreds of countries used by millions of people that they all work every day. Um, with .NET Core, we have an opportunity to um, move much faster, uh, try out new things, and um, see how they work. So uh, in the .NET Core 2.0 project, um, we added um, a few new somewhat revolutionary features, um, span of T and memory of T. Um, or maybe those are going to 2.1. I actually can't remember. But that's, sure. that's, no, that's not the but, point. But it's, it's part of the immediate roadmap. Yeah. You guys are able to evolve and add something yeah. really awesome. Yeah, and so to we get to do, because um, A, there aren't nearly as many people using .NET Core today, and B, because of the side-by-side -side installs, it's really the, this one that's the important point. Mm -hmm. It means that we get to try out these new features, collect some information about um, like feedback, about how they're working. And then once they're tried and true, then we can bring them back to .NET Framework where we have um, much more responsibility. Well, that, that's an important kind of thing to say to the audience. Like .NET Framework is still the thing we work on, oh, right? Totally. It, is, it totally. is not going anywhere. They don't have to worry about you know, .NET Framework going away or no. you having to move everything. Uh, it's just a parallel project that's designed for very specific things and able to take advantage of you know, and, and optimize and do, do things that we, we just can't do it when it's installed on billions of machines with the framework. Oh, for sure. And I think actually the existence of Core will actually help us add value to .NET Framework more quickly, just because we have this testing ground that's a safer place for us to work as engineers. Yeah. Um, whereas with .NET Framework, that's a little bit harder. Yeah, and also, you know, .NET Core, I don't want to scare people when I talk to them about it, and I, I often have to explain this part, which is, yes, it's open source, it's moving fast, but there, there is a point where you guys ship an MSI, right? There is a stable oh, point, totally. you download it, you install it. You don't have to worry, a daily build done by the team is going to break your dev environment or something. No, That's I, up to you at that point if you adopt the newer bits, but there is yeah. a stable point that we're going to keep shipping. Oh, yeah, and also, these daily builds don't just magically end up on yeah. your machine. You have you to know. really work to get them. <laughs> yeah, you have to really work to get them and to find them. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so we, do we ship um, preview releases back to the .NET Core 2.0 project. We ship preview one, we ship preview two. Yeah. Um, we're about to ship another release relatively soon. And um, we tell people exactly what's in them. We actually publish detailed release notes. Yeah, um, yeah so the release notes are good, and there's a road roadmap, and yeah. that's all up on GitHub. Yeah, and so people can kind of make decisions about what it is they want to build. And then once it goes um, RTM or RTW, um, then we're just on like a servicing plan mm -hmm. where um, we actually have an extremely high bar, um, somewhat similar actually to our .NET Framework bar uh, for taking changes. And uh, it's very hard to get servicing changes in place, which is actually a good thing. Yeah. Those are just for reliability, security, and um, you know, severe performance problems. And then most of the effort would go into 2.1. Mm -hmm. At that point, yeah, that makes sense. And as part of all of this, you know, the the, the last thing probably we should talk about is .NET Standard. I Definitely. think it's worth saying that .NET Core 2.0 and .NET Standard 2.0 come hand in hand, right? So we're shipping those together. And mm -hmm. so, what does .NET Standard mean for folks? Sure. So um, it's a, totally just a spec. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this. It's a promise. It's a it's a promise. Although uh, it's I would say it's stronger than that because um, it's actually part of the you know, Visual Studio experience. Like it has mm -hmm. actual artifacts around sure. it. But um, uh, so we had portable class libraries before. That was a good-ish uh, good um, code sharing solution. But it didn't kind of make any forward-looking statements on what new, ver new .NET implementations needed to do. Whereas what .NET standard does is it says, these are the minimum APIs that you need in your product in order to be part of the, uh, to be a proper .NET implementation. Mm -hmm. Based on a certain version of the standard. Yeah, right? and so um, we have multiple versions of the standard. Uh, so one analogy that people have been using is HTML. Mm -hmm. um, HTML is a spec. You can't um, use it for anything right. on, in and of itself. You have to implement it as, as a company or whatever. A yeah, as a, as a, as, and then, um, so there's several versions of HTML, and then there are browsers. Um, there are several of those. Um, Microsoft even makes one or, sure. or, or two, uh, depending how you count. Yeah. Um, 
And then uh, those browser makers, um, you know, there's like Chrome version 50 or something like that, and it will say we support HTML5 plus these, you know, extensions plus these CSS versions. So .NET Standard is very much like that. So .NET Core 2.0 will implement .NET Standard 2.0. .NET Framework 4.6.1, I believe, and above, also implement mm -hmm. um, .NET Standard 2.0 and the Xamarin products. Um, at the same time, we ship .NET Core 2.0. We'll also implement .NET Standard 2.0. And then the only other one to discuss is our UWP .NET implementation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that will uh, support .NET Standard 2.0 later in 2017. Yeah. So, the thing though is, is that it's like, oh, okay, I see the versions match. Um, so when you ship .NET Core 2.1, will you ship a .NET Standard 2.1? And the answer is probably not. Um, .NET Standard is actually intended to be relatively slow moving um, because it's it's completely for class libraries. And um, yeah, .NET Standard is not about the XAML, right? I mean, no. I mean, there, there's a XAML conversation we can have with, with XAML standard, but but just the scope of our thing today is it's about making sure that you can reuse code, and therefore it's about the class library conversation. Yeah. So. Um, or then you get package. Yeah. Right? Whatever. So, whatever yeah, you need to extend all, your and application. And those are mostly the same thing. Yeah. So we'll decide um, uh, what are the next things that we want to put in .NET Standard. But um, I'm not seeing that in the next six months that we're going to put out a new .NET Standard version. So it'll be .NET Standard 2.0 will kind of be the thing for number, a while. Number two is, is the theme of this show because we're like, we're talking about .NET Core 2.0. It's the preview 2 release <laughs> and we're going to talk about .NET Standard 2.0. Not to confuse you folks too much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so and just we have to be two clear, arms and legs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we have two arms and legs and, and hopefully more fingers. But, um, but the reality is that, that this is just coincidence that that .NET Core 2.0, that .NET Standard 2.0 line up, but, but that's not the shipping intent going right. forward. It'll just, whatever makes sense, we'll do that. Yeah, some people actually asked us, so we had um, a set of .NET Standard 1.X versions all the mm -hmm. way up to 1.6, and some people said, well, when you, if you think about Semver, semantic versioning, mm -hmm. um, you really uh, use a major version number in case of a breaking change. So they said to us, like, oh, are you, is there a breaking change that's coming in .NET Standard? And the answer is no. Um, but uh, we decided to create a major version for two main reasons. One was um, we're adding something like, we're over doubling the number of APIs that are in .NET Standard from 1.6 to 2.0. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 130% increase. It's, it's some crazy number. Yeah, so that's quite large. Uh, and then the other one is, is the way .NET Standard is structured kind of under the hood is changing uh, quite a bit. It's not anything that library developers have to worry about like from a breaking change standpoint or anything like that. But we felt like those two things, um, kind of the architectural change and the increase in APIs meant that a 2.0 was warranted. Yeah. So. Okay, that makes sense. All right. so, yeah, let's talk about what's new in, yeah, so, in 2.0. So that makes sense. So let's switch gears to, to the current release, right? Yeah. So now we're going to go talk about .NET Core 2.0, the preview 2 release of it, which enables a bunch more capabilities. So why don't you go through it? And then we're going to talk through a blog post. So there is a blog post on the Visual Studio team blog, and there's other supporting blog posts. We'll link all of those in the show notes. So let's go through what's in the uh, Yeah, so this is actually the .NET team blog. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the .NET team blog. <laughs> yeah. I, I have my blogs a little confused. I yeah. spent too much time reading them. Uh, so yeah, let's go through this. Um, I have some other things that I think are maybe not covered in depth here, but we'll go through this first. Sure. So we care a lot about platforms um, on our team. Uh, so when we had .NET Framework, it was always Windows, Windows, Windows. Um, with .NET Core, it's definitely a broader set of releases that we um, work on. So the first thing is uh, Azure, which sure. is quite important to our team, and so. We worked with the Azure um, App Services team to uh, make sure that .NET Core 2.0 was supported. Yeah, and some, some people don't, don't always realize that like, app, uh, app Service is like the websites, right? So if yes. you're deploying your websites to the managed infrastructure, you're not just doing your own VM and your own thing, but if you want to use App Service website capability, you can deploy uh, .NET Core 2.0 Preview 2 now there, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's essentially, essentially um, a SaaS service, mm -hmm. right? You don't have yeah. to do much. And so um, one of the great scenarios that they have for websites is you can 
put all your code in a GitHub repository, public or private, or Visual Studio team system. Mm -hmm. I think you know about that. Yes. Um, and put that in a, on v Visual Studio team system. You can either use Git or TFS. And then team services, though. Oh, sorry. Team it's services. Okay. Thank you. I, am, I almost didn't catch it myself. Okay. Because, you know, you say something that close. Yeah. It's a bit hard. Yeah. So, um, you can check in your source code, mm -hmm. and then you can set up um, a trigger such that every time you commit at least to a particular branch, mm -hmm. uh, then you kind of have a CI CD flow, and then your code gets um, pushed to production in your Azure website. So, I actually do that on some of my sites, and um, it's awesome. But when you do that, you're not, you're not the one who's shipping .NET Core. You're just effectively shipping source code. Yeah. And so .NET Core has to be in the cloud in Azure um, in order yeah. for that to all Because all it's work. a SaaS, so, so yeah. we, we control what's in there, what's enabled. Yeah. And uh, App Service, I believe, supports like Node.js oh, yeah. and, and .NET, the you know, standard version, and now .NET Core is up to Preview 2 for the yes. 2 release. Yeah, so when it, anyways, whenever we ship, we try and have um, same-day shipment. Mm -hmm. to, to Azure, and so we have to work with that team, um, and they're awesome actually, um, to make sure that if you want to host your Preview 2 site in Azure also on the same day, you can. Cool. Um, another one is we do a lot of work with Docker. Uh, we've had Docker images now for, I want to say like two years on uh, Docker Hub, and we've mm -hmm. actually learned a lot um, in that time frame, and also Docker has changed a fair bit. And those are Linux images behind the scenes, right? Uh, no, both. We have okay, Linux so and okay. Windows images there. Um, that's actually, that was an awesome segue, actually. So, in the past, Docker was Linux only. And then um, the Windows team started talking to the Docker folks and said, ah, we think um, Windows would be good here. And so, many changes needed to be made to Docker, not just to make it Windows friendly, but just to enable it to support another operating system, sure. no matter what that was. Yeah, Docker started a small company. Linux was the thing that they started with. It made yeah. sense for them to do that. Yeah, so we've been working closely with um, the Docker team. Um, the Windows team has, but so has um, the .NET team. And so there's been cases where something about Docker didn't work super well for us, and um, they've actually made changes to the public Docker implementation, yeah. which has been awesome. And their tools on Windows are getting much better. I mean, they, you know, oh, they yeah. didn't start there, but now it's, it's beautiful. I can install it and it just works most of the time. Yep. So one of the things we did is um, there's this concept called uh, multi-arch, uh, which I'll maybe describe a little bit later. And um, it basically says what's the default um, Linux version that you'll use. And so Debian 8, also called Jesse, uh, was the one that we've been using for the past two, two years. And so this new version called Stretch Debian 9 mm -hmm. came out, um, and they're all named after Toy Story characters. Um, That's cool. Yes, um, it came out like two weeks before we shipped Preview 2. And so we decided that that was the time to start uh, making Stretch our default. There actually is a, a quicker path to security fixes going into Stretch than Jesse. So that was actually the biggest motivator for us. We felt that for customers that, aren't, that are basically just trusting our default choice, which I think is probably a lot mm -hmm. of customers, we wanted to make sure that they were absolutely in the best spot. And we right. felt Debian Stretch was that because of this. Um, it's, it's the latest, so it's probably got all the goodness, but we also saw that they fixed security issues there the fastest. So cool. that seemed like an easy choice. Yeah, yeah it looks good. Um, SUSE Linux, we started to talk to the SUSE company. They wanted us to support SLES 12, and we did. Cool. Um, um, Mac OS High Sierra, so Apple puts out you know, one or two Mac releases. Um, so far, <laughs> they always break us um, during their beta period, and so we always have to make changes. Um, High Sierra is turning out to be more work for us to support than Sierra was. Sierra was actually quite small, what the issue was. And so we don't have, um, in Preview 2, uh, we don't have support for Mac OS High Sierra, even though it says it here. Um, it's, it's limited. Uh, 
Yeah. So we and are. The Google fixed on that. an issue that was we found, fixed, but maybe there's more. There is. So we're, we're still in preview. Like that, yeah. that's one thing I want to tell the audience. Like that Core two oh, this is still a preview release. We're not here talking about something that's you know supported in production or, or ready for prime yeah. time. This is to get people ready for the newest thing. Yeah. So what happened is. Uh, in this time frame, yeah, we fixed a bug, which is you couldn't even run the .NET command. Um, or you could run the .NET command, but you couldn't run .NET new or restore. Right, you couldn't do anything with it. <laughs> you couldn't do anything useful. Yeah. I th that was fixed in the preview 2 time frame, but then we found another set mm -hmm. of bugs that we, I think, didn't know about when I wrote this blog post. So we're very actively, it's actually the, uh, if I think about what's left in the .NET Core 2.0 release, that is the most, the most active effort right now. So we're putting a, a bunch of effort into it. We filed, I think, four bugs um, with Apple that they're mm -hmm. looking into. So we're doing everything we can. That's cool, yeah. And then when we um, do support um, High Sierra, we'll do it for 2.0 and the 1.x releases. Yeah, and, and the, we're talking about the dev environment for people, right? So if you, if oh, you yeah. work on, on Windows today, you're fine. If you deploy to Linux, you're fine in the sense that you can, you, we don't know of anything that should block you in theory, right? This is the one dev environment where we, we're still working through some problems. Oh, yeah. No, this is um, not every customer for sure is going to be affected by this, and it will get fixed. It, yeah. It's just. We, we want Ma the Mac developer to be happy. Yeah, and I mean, uh, this is mostly about right now people who have already adopted it being successful. Mm -hmm. I completely um, believe that we'll have all of this fixed by the time High Sierra ships. Um, so I imagine 99% of People using MacBooks are not on High Sierra. Yeah, it's not out there either. Yeah. We're just we're just that forward looking. We want to be sure we're there when well, they do ship. Yeah, I mean, actually, you need a developer account with Apple to even download this, mm -hmm. uh, which I actually I I have. I have another MacBook that um, has High Sierra on it, um, which I've actually lent to the dev team <laughs> so that they can fix this issue. Cool. A um, couple more things. Uh, .NET Restore is this um, command that people had to use all the time to restore their NuGet packages. Um, every time you changed your project file, it would invalidate the, the restore that you had run and you would have to run it again. Uh, I think that was annoying to a lot of people. Certainly was to me. So we've made that command implicit for all the other commands that require restore to have occurred. So build and run and publish are, and test are all good examples of those. So do you check for changes, I guess, and run it as, as needed? Or yeah. do you guys always Yeah, no, it? it's, it's smart. Um, mm -hmm. it, so, uh, so that's huge. We've got a cool. lot of people happy about that. Yeah, I think I saw that it, during build when, uh, I think Hanselman was demoing something, or Damien, somebody was doing the demo. And yeah. Yeah, that was cool. It is cool. Um, you can now reference .NET Framework libraries from .NET Standard. Mm. So this one's a little bit surprising um, and is is not um, kind of in alignment with some our decision making from the past. The way we used to do things, um, and I, this is a little bit tongue in cheek, so hopefully no one is upset by this comment, but it's, we used to kind of think like, oh dear developer, we, we know better than you, so we're going to set some policies that keep you safe. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's not like all of those decisions were bad. Clearly a ton of them, um, helped people who wouldn't necessarily have known that they were supposed to go left instead of right. Um, in this particular case, um, uh, clearly not every single .NET Framework library that's been written will run on .NET Core on Linux, for example. Sure. Clearly if you're um, newing up WPF buttons, then that's not going to work at all. Yeah. But we did this analysis and we found that uh, over 70% of libraries on NuGet.org, actually, that sorry, 70% of .NET Framework libraries on NuGet.org, actually fit within the um, the constraints of .NET Standard 2.0. And so we said to ourselves, why would we not those those libraries? Not all of them is are going to get converted to .NET Standard 2.0 on day one. Yeah. At day 365. Um, a bunch of them won't have been converted. Yeah. And, and, so and anybody that's been for the cycle knows this is going to be like the, the point of like, oh, I can't move forward, right? Like .NET, stand, uh, .NET Core 2.0 get, gets released, it's great, it's in production, I can use it, and then I need some library, now I can't. That would have been yeah, really so bad for people. Yeah, sense. so we decided um, 
we're going to enable people to depend on any .NET Framework library they want. Um, there actually is a warning in the product to, um, to tell you that this is a decision point that you need to make. Sure. Um, so You're taking out a dependency that's only going to work when the .NET Framework of whatever version or that component of whatever version that depends on the framework will now have to be there when you're running your application and your environment. So it won't uh, work well, on Linux uh, if no, you deploy it because there won't be .NET no, Framework? No, no, that, that's not quite how it works. Okay, so tell us. Um, so you don't need .NET Framework in place. Um, all it means is, uh, like inside a .NET Framework library, you know, it's just IL code. It's just a bunch yeah. of IL instructions. There's nothing, there's no Windows-ness per se that's in there. Um, so, if in the best case scenario, you have a .NET Framework library, the APIs that it use, uses fits within the spec of .NET Standard 2.0, then that will absolutely work on um, .NET Core, on any one of the operating systems, mm -hmm. and you don't need to install anything other than .NET Core in order to make that work. Makes sense, right. Uh, because it's just code. Um, just, it's super simple. Now, um, like I said, we put a, there's a little warning there, and you actually have to, and we can show you this later, although um, it's not quite working yet. Um, uh, there's a little warning there that you have to put on each package reference to make it very clear that you've made a decision because it's um, kind of a buyer beware scenario. But like I said, we didn't feel like we should be the ones putting this policy in front of people and preventing them from getting their jobs done. Right. We, we removed the, the inflexibility, right? So we made it flexible. You can do what you want, but then... We tell you when you're paying a potential price for that. Okay. Uh, I guess the only other thing I'll mention is we got teased actually a little bit. <laughs> we had um, we've had these somewhat crazy file names. Now you would think like, why do people care so much about file names? But so for our you know our MSIs, our ZIPs, our PKGs, um, uh, not only did people not like them, I think they kind of thought we were insane, and um, there was some reason for them to believe that. Uh, so in .NET Core 2.0, we did a complete revamp of all the file names and all the package names like as it relates to like apt-get on Linux. Mm -hmm. um, a group of us sat down months ago now, and we wrote up a spec, which is actually now on GitHub, and um, we said, we know you haven't liked our file names. Here's our new, our new proposal for how the file names are going to work, and we got a ton of thumbs up, and then we implemented the that. Building spec. in the open down to the file name spec. Oh, yeah, <laughs> down to the file name spec. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but people cared about that a lot, so, and, and, I, and I get it. So. Cool. Um, I guess I'll just will show one more. Um, I know we probably want to get to demos. Um, so this isn't really a .NET Core 2.0 thing per se, but um, C Sharp 7 kind of landed in the same general time frame as us. It shipped. Um, with VS 2017 mm -hmm. um, RTM, and so I just want to remind people. So we're not going to go through this whole this whole document, but I want to remind people that C Sharp 7 is kind of like um, a sibling project to .NET Core 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, it's D C Sharp 7 is absolutely supported in .NET Core 2.0. So, so one one before yeah, actually, that. Actually, no, no, I, no. You should be no. You can use it there too. Okay. Um, but if you're using VS 2017, C Sharp 7 is there for you. Yeah. If you're using .NET Core 2.0, it's definitely there for you. Yeah. And you should, you should take a look at some of the cool things we've done with that yeah. spec. So it's, it's just in the same time frame. Um, they actually started work on C Sharp 7.1 yeah. um, already. That's definitely not shipped yet. But um, it's definitely a sibling project that um, we work super closely with these folks. So I felt the need to mention it. Yeah, and you guys also ship like Entity Framework uh, Core 2.0. Yep. Also had a preview release at the same time. So again, we, we can't cover everything in this episode, but we'll have links in the show notes for, for all of these things. And did I miss anything else? Uh, ASP.NET Core 2.0. ASP.NET Core. Well, yeah. yeah. So when I think of .NET Core, I somehow think of ASP.NET, oh, yeah. but that's not the only thing it is. Uh, yeah, it's uh, also the core library. Yeah, for sure. Um, just one cool. other tab. Um, so in GitHub, we created this um, repository called um, uh, .NET slash announcements. Um, there's actually an ASP.NET slash announcements, so we, mm -hmm. we copied um, that. Um, and uh, we've actually started posting announcements here on a fairly regular basis. And so you can watch this repository. 
And um, so you use the issues tab to post yeah. so something that you, you're changing as you guys head towards RTM. Right. And uh, so one thing we do is uh, whenever I post one, I'm not the only one who does this, but we actually lock the conversation right from day one. And the reason we do that isn't because we're trying to prevent discussion. It's that um, for people that watch the repository, all they get are our announcements. There's no additional conversation, right. which could be an immense oh, yeah. set of traffic. So some change could, uh, like a file name, I don't know. You guys yeah. say, oh, that's fast spec, we forget it. We're going back to the old file names. Yeah, so um, <laughs> what we do is there's always this details section, and then these are the actual issues on GitHub where this thing was discussed, right. and then you can click on those and have the discussion there if you would like. Cool. So. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. People should go to where you're actually working on the issue because that's tracking the, that change. And this is just the summary for, for like the yes. high-level overview. This is what we've changed, why we've changed it. Yeah, that's exactly the outcome it. of that. But I encourage people to go check out this repository and watch it so they cool. can keep I, up. I miss this, so even I'm learning something today. Yes. Very cool. We'll link, we'll link it as well. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah, we have some notes here. I was wondering if there's anything that we missed that we wanted to talk yep, about. We've got... Um, I think we covered uh, the majority of okay, it. Okay, so we'll just go to some more yeah. demo-oriented stuff. Yeah, so l let's, let's look at some demos. I think the first one that you had on there was uh, you're going to use the Mac. We're going to show Visual Studio for Mac. So folks, maybe you, you missed this release. So uh, we, we have GA'd a product called Visual Studio for Mac. So that is available out there for you. And uh, Rich is about to show you how uh, Visual Studio for Mac can be used not just for mobile development, but for web development. Yes. With .NET Core, too. Yeah, so... Um, uh, right now, um, .NET Core 2.0 is not supported in the stable channel. So right now, I'm in the beta channel. Mm -hmm. When VS 15.3 ships, then the bits that I'm using now will go to the stable channel. Sure. And everyone will be able to use this. This is actually almost identical to what's happening with uh, Visual Studio for Windows. Which is if you want to do .NET Core 2.0 development, you need... 15.3. 15.3. Which is which also is in a, preview. Which is also in preview. Yeah. So it's, it's basically the same. Yeah. I just want to... We've had a lot of people come to us and say like, oh, I tried to use VS for Mac, or oh, I tried to use Visual Studio on Windows, and I couldn't do .NET Core 2.0 development. We're in this period where you need preview releases of these IDEs in order to play along. Right, because there's a whole tooling experience that goes with it, so therefore it has to evolve and, and get to a GA at some point, but like I'm assuming VS Code's a bit more straightforward because it's just a code editor. You yes. can edit your code, you don't need, do, do you need to be, I guess I'm just asking the question, to be on some unstable version no, of code? No, that's, that's, that's right, you do not. Okay, so um, code is the only one you can just pick up RTM yes. version of. Yeah, okay. so code ships quite um, regularly. Yeah, very regular. Uh, well, sorry, it's, it's it actually has almost nothing to do with code per se. It's actually the C sharp extension mm -hmm. that is the the thing that's giving you the .NET the support. Yeah, yeah, the experience, the debugging, the IntelliSense, yeah. all that comes from. So code. that also ships quite regularly. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're on the latest one, you'll be you'll be fine. So there's no like preview version of that C sharp uh, extension. No, well there there are preview versions as but, well. But that but you, you require. Yeah, you but require you don't them. need them for for this. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'll just show the super basic experience. Um, I'm just in full screen, just so we don't have to look at all the stuff on my desktop. And so, um, yeah, if you haven't seen Visual Studio for Mac before, this is what it looks like. There's a, a set of different kind of categories um, there, and so naturally we would go down to the .NET Core area. Uh, we have a console app, and then um, ASP.NET Core app. So let's, we might as well start with that. Sure. And so the first screen that you see is uh, Target Framework. So for this demo, we're definitely going to use .NET Core 2.0. Uh, and pretty soon, that's what everyone is going to be using. And then um, Toolbox and Create a Project. And, and would the, uh, I would assume that this solution checked into your Git repo on VSTS or GitHub, somebody with a PC and the Mac can work on the same project. That just works? Oh, for sure. Um, by default, there is nothing OS specific um, that is added to your projects. Uh, you, you would have to do uh, something in particular. Yeah. To make your, it your code would have to break the runtime for your Mac colleague, right? Yeah. Or, the, or vice versa. It's not about our tools, it's not about our framework. Definitely. 
Uh, and, I, and I do that all the time. There's um, a project, that a personal project of mine that I work on where um, sometimes I'm on my desktop PC at home, sometimes I'm on my desktop PC at work, and sometimes I'm on this MacBook on the plane, and um, I'm just always going um, back and forth. Cool. And uh, it all works. So yeah, we start here with this blank screen, and uh, this is kind of like Solution Explorer from VS. Sure. And all of this kind of looks normal. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the solution. <laughs> yeah. You got the code. And uh, we have NuGet dependencies, and we're just, just dependent on um, .NET Core 2.0. So that all looks normal. Um, if you want, you can, uh, how do you do this? Oh, I can't quite see it. Anyway, I was going to say you can edit the project file. But I'm, I can't, I can't. This oh. is the one time I'm not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> edit file there. That might do it. Uh, but I think that's edit the file. Okay, that is that. Yeah. Okay. So you can uh, look at your project file. You can see it's relatively small. Um, yeah, and you can edit here if you want. Anyway, let's, um, I'm just going to run the app. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where, um, Full screen is probably not going to be the best choice. Oops. Um, okay. Oh, wow. That was quick. Um, so that opened up that application. So okay. local, local run, local debug. Yeah. And so here you'll see actually we're on localhost 5000, port 5000, mm -hmm. which is the default. You can certainly change that. And if we go here, and set a breakpoint in this controller. That's the home controller. Yeah, that all that all works. Yeah. And you've got your threads. You've got your call stack. All, all well, not, not everything from Visual Studio on the PC, but, but quite a bit of those capabilities are are there in the Mac version. Yes, all uh, the basic things that I would expect to be there are there. Yes, they're they're totally there. Um, yeah, so we're we're all kind of at home there. And like you said, you can move this project to your your PC and. It would all work. Every time I see this, I'm still blown away that we have a Mac IDE, that we have a code editor, editor that can run on Linux, that you guys ship into Docker containers. I mean, it, it's just a whole new world. It is. They, a they thought open, us open sourcing this thing years ago would be the big thing, and now it's like, oh, open source, whatever. This is, you know, yeah. this is the really awesome part of it all, uh, because the productivity you get with, a, with an IDE sometimes is just much better than just a code editor, and sometimes vice versa. So we give you the choice. And yes. we have a community version, right? So this is a free version of VS4 for, for Mac. It is. Um, yeah, it's amazing. You can just go and download this and just start using it. And um, I mean, there are some rules about. Um, sure, there's a license. You should read the license. We we are not lawyers. Yes. Blah blah blah. That's, disclaimer. That's, that's not our. Um, well, Richard might be a lawyer. I don't know. Yeah. I, I asked him that question. Um, yeah. Okay. I was trying to see if. This one, uh, this other demo actually might be on my other machine. I was wanting to show some stuff with unit tests. Yeah, that's the second demo that we wanted to do, the unit yeah. test one. Uh, oh, yeah. No, it's here. Cool. It's, this label got on, t on top of um, what I was trying to show. Right, so we're switching to a, to a different solution, different project. Yeah, here. this is actually one of my, it's not really a personal project as in one I work at, at home or for, it is actually a work project. But um, it's not really part of my main job. Sure. It's, this, this isn't building that net for a living. But yes. Um, something related, and you've got some unit tests in there. Yeah. So let's see. Um, I've actually never seen how you do unit tests in VS for Mac. So I'm uh, I have similar. Yes, I have done this. Um, let's see. I hope so. If <laughs> I, I do. I have done this um, uh, actually quite recently. Um, where are the tests? Oh, run unit tests. There we go. So what we should see, so I have two projects here. Reader is the actual... Um, uh, yeah, the, the project you build. The project and Reader yeah. tests. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so you got like a test, test explorer or whatever it's called in, yeah. in the PC version nowadays. And you can see how they did once you run them. Yes, so you can click this run all button and... Uh, these are the, so I actually, I guess I have, I think I have 21 or 24 tests. It only seems to be finding 16. 
But um, yeah, but, but I guess the the big fact here is that it, you know what we're trying to demonstrate. We've got you know the .NET Core. It's running in a Mac. We got an ID. It's running in a Mac. We're debugging. We're running locally to, to debug with, I, with a local, well, not IIS. I almost said IIS. I, I don't think a Mac has IIS, but they have a web server where you guys brought something with it, and you can actually unit test against that as well. So it's a full normal life cycle. Yeah, so you, you might actually not know this, um, but um, so we have this web server called Kestrel. Yes, Kestrel, right. Yeah, so that's our default web server mm -hmm. in all cases. Yeah, even on Windows, even right? Even on that's Windows. Really default too. Um, and so with Dynamic Framework, the way that uh, it integrates with IES in process. Um, so it, it has a very kind of close relationship and they're kind of tied together at the hip. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with Kestrel, we kind of went with this different model, which is actually more similar to um, the, other, the way other people build um, web frameworks in the world. And so Kestrel runs in its own process. Um, it's actually not intended uh, in this time frame to be a front-facing web server. You actually put another web server in front of it, like IIS, like mm. Nginx, um, like Apache. That is actually the thing that takes traffic and then it kind of proxies that traffic mm, I see. to, to Kestrel. Kestrel. And so there's a whole series of um, attacks, for lack of a better term, or um, challenges that Kestrel doesn't have to deal with because this front-facing web server right. deals with it's it. It's not taking the traffic, so the, the attack would hit that first, whatever, the yeah, front exactly. of it. Exactly. And Makes sense. now, at some point, we may decide to make Kestrel appropriate for those scenarios, but in certainly in the .NET Core 2.0 timeframe, it's this behind uh, front-facing web server scenario. Cool. I, I forget, is Kestrel open source? It is. Yeah. Awesome. It cool. is. Uh, and under the hoods, um, Something didn't work well with this test. I have no idea. It's almost like we're showing a preview release. It's almost like we're showing a preview and, release. And your machine, which might even, for all you remember, have some bits <laughs> yeah. you didn't intend to. So actually, the next thing was um, we were going. Uh, Docker. Yeah, well, I, I want to. Um, oh. Oh. Uh, I was on the wrong machine. I want to. Try. Oh, you want to try? Run yeah, I want to try it on this here. so that people think that um, I was truthful about my. Uh, there we go. Actually, this project is. Um, oh yeah, test explorer is up. Yep. Um, this project uh, has uh, it, it's hosted in Git. And um, it has that uh, continuous deployment experience with Azure websites that I talked about before. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and so I know that when I'm working in it, when I check into master, then it does the auto deploy. Yeah, your tests have to pass first, I'm assuming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And so we'll run all the tests. Uh, it has to build them all first. Unexpected uh, error. Okay, there must be a problem with this. But uh, yeah, but the test passed. The so pe tests all passed. Shows you that. And um, so that's good. Yeah, twenty-one tests passed. Yeah, they're just so a warning. It seems like, but otherwise, um, I think that probably fits into our. Oh, actually, the warning is to do with my code. Um, yeah. That actually that has nothing to do with .NET Core. It's because um, there's an await I'm using in a non-standard way. I've I've seen these in my own yeah. in my own life quite a few times. That that exact warning. Okay, so. So cool. I think I proved to everyone that I have I have tests for that project. So let's let's talk about um, Docker. Docker. So here's the experience. So you go underneath the web node, and then there's a um, .NET Core web application on .NET Core scenario. Mm -hmm. I'll just quickly explain what the other two options are. So the very first one is .NET Framework ASP.NET web app that, that's going to enable you to build a web forms or an MVC application right. on .NET Th Framework. That, that's, that's not core, right? That's, that's, that's what core. was there before. Exactly. That's your web application. Yeah. And core is the same thing, but we're using core. So yeah. you don't have certain things like web forms. Yeah. And then the very last one is we enable a scenario where you can build, use the ASP.NET Core web framework, but run it on top of .NET Framework. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a good choice if you want to opt in to the new web framework. But um, you have dependencies on um, components or APIs that are not in .NET Core. Mm -hmm. um, or if you want to kind of do a, 
Um, you don't want to do the whole migration at once to .NET Core. It's like, let's, let's change our web framework to ASP.NET Core, get that in place and feel comfortable, and then we'll move the base to .NET Core as a second step. Yep. So you could do that too. That makes sense. So are you pointing this out because you need to use the middle one, the core web application, yes, yeah. for the Docker scenario, right? Uh, actually, yes. Um, okay. Docker might work in the, I think Docker works in the first one as well. I believe we don't yet support it for the third one, but we mm -hmm. intend to. Okay. So what happens is you pick, you get this menu. It tells you which um, target frameworks are available. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we'll use 2.0. And then um, there's a checkbox called Enable Docker Support. Mm -hmm. I have it checked, and you get to decide whether you want to target Windows or Linux. Yeah, and, and basically just the Docker tools should be installed on, on the dev machine before That's that. That's a very good idea. Yeah, otherwise, otherwise this won't work. Otherwise it won't work. And so it creates your project. In the very bottom... You've got a whale. Yeah, I've got a, a whale. Sign. It doesn't seem to have any errors, which is uh, also a good sign. Yeah. As I learned the other day, uh, when I was cursing at my computer, only slightly. Yes. But <laughs> that um, was all my fault, it turned out. Uh, it's possible. So right now I'm on Windows containers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can see here, it says switch to Linux containers. Yeah. So um, I, I use both. And so here's the, the Docker file. Um, I actually write these Docker files all day long. Um, this is actually, this piece here is the... Uh, zoom. I always forget where that is, 200%. Yeah, that's the base image mm -hmm. um, that you're using. It's actually going to be downloaded from Docker Hub. It actually isn't downloaded from Microsoft, although we push um, our images there um, ourselves. Yeah, well, well, it, it's their Docker has a repository of images. Yes. If anybody new like, like me <laughs> to the Docker world, I'm still ramping up, and we publish our image with, with certain path over here, you can specify which one of those images you want to pull from us or from whoever. Yeah. And this um, Docker file is, is the thing that tells Docker what, what's your intent. Yeah, so when you press the, the, the button here, to the, that is normally the debug button, here it says Docker. Mm -hmm. What it's doing is it's um, making sure you have all the right assets on your machine from Docker Hub. Um, I did that ahead of time, so we should be good. Is it going to show you what it's doing in the output window? Because it seems like you, you hit the button, right, and it's doing something. Is there uh, some activity? Yes. Okay, so there, we, you can actually see, like, I, I as a developer love, love to know what's going on, call me paranoid, but... Yeah, actually, we're going to um, do some more work in this experience so that people that don't know they're supposed to go to the output window to see progress mm -hmm. will get some kind of a progress experience because some parts of Docker um, just can take a long time, yeah. um, particularly if you have a slow internet connection. And uh, so what it does is it downloads all the right required assets from Docker Hub. Mm -hmm. It then builds a Docker image, uh, and then it runs it. Yeah. Um, and the first time takes longer than um, other times. Sure. So it's the, the usual rules apply a first run. Yeah. And then, then we get that same website, because we're using the same cool. template. And, um, and, and the great thing here is that now you're, you're, you could be sure that once you build it against your dev environment using this Docker approach, it's going to work when you push it to the next environment, the, the thing that Docker does for us, right? One of the big, biggest things. And, and the cool thing from VS, now that I've had time myself to play with it, you can attach you know, breakpoints, right? All that stuff. Well, your dev experience works the way you, you expect it to, basically. Right, so we can change this. Press save. And I believe that was the about one, uh, which is actually the one we're on. Cool. So I actually... Then just stop debugging to change no. your, your HTML, that's cool. Yeah, so... I would have so stopped debugging that. I'm so used to that, I call me person of habit. But Yeah, so cool I did not... Um, I didn't change anything. Yeah, so it's watching the file system as you change project files. Yeah, and I think... I think I can even change this. Change this razor syntax. It's mm -hmm. probably going to say something not very useful now. <laughs> but... Oh, okay, changes to nothing. But uh, that still proves the point. Yeah. That um, it did take the change. It just didn't compile, I guess, to, um, to read the page. Or I don't know what actually was um, what was in this. Uh, actually, if we if we switch it back now, yeah. let's let's see. Yeah, that's that's a good test. Yeah. There you go. So um, the main point is, you know, we've had features like I didn't continue mm -hmm. to try and make people uh, super productive, as we've adopted this, you know, fairly significant technology like Docker, 
We've actually tried to retain as many of those high, high productivity experiences. Um, and I think I just demonstrated that. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. Now, I know we, we also um, had uh, a multi-stage build. That sure. You Did you want to show that? Yeah, so that one I'm going to show from the command line. Um, it's very new. Um, so what, what is it? I can describe oh. it because even I'm not sure what, what you're going to demo. Yeah, so one of the things with Docker that on the face of it is actually there's two goals that are a little bit contradictory, um, meaning up until multi-stage build, it was hard to um, be green on both of them, um, even though you wanted to be. So I'll tell you what the goals are. One is you want to be using Docker all the time, meaning um, I'd like to both build my application in Docker containers and then host my application in Docker con containers and also do the thing in the middle, which is test in Docker containers because the promise that you get from Docker of consistency and reproducibility is, is equally valuable at all three points. Mm -hmm. And then the second goal is that um, I want my prod, my runtime, based Docker container to be as small as possible. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really care nearly to the same degree about my um, dev time and my test time sure. containers. The reason why this was, um, I won't say contradictory, but um, there was friction in achieving both of these at the same time is because you had to write these scripts that took, ran, you know, built uh, your app with one Docker container, pulled out some assets, and then put them into a test container, and then took the results of that, um, and then finally you build a runtime container. So this was all possible, but not very easy, so a lot of people didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So what multi-stage build is, is you can build a single Docker file that describes this whole thing. There's no scripts. You can actually, in a declarative way, take the output of one Docker container and use it in, the pro in another one. And cool. um, even better yet, you can actually Docker run. So imagine you have like a four-stage, multi-stage build. You can actually Docker run to just the second or third stage mm. if you want. So you don't even have to do the whole thing. That's cool. So yeah, show it over. Um, yeah, so we have, I'll take you to another GitHub thing, um, .NET, slash, uh, .NET slash Docker slash samples. And... Um, if you actually go down here to the README, it actually says multi-stage build. I'm just going to summarize this. It says we've updated these samples to use multi-stage build, mm -hmm. uh, which is awesome. And so, um, if I oh, and I guess I'll I'll show you one of them. So I would actually say we're probably one of the first um, developer platforms to adopt multi-stage builds. So here is the first from, and we're saying, uh, um, this is my base image, and then I'm giving a name to um, this thing I'm about to build. I'm calling it build environment. Mm -hmm. And then this whole thing um, through here is build environment. And then I'm creating a new runtime image. Right. So, so the, fr the from command is, is declaring the start of Yes, yeah, yeah, that's basically build. your demarcator. Demarcator, yeah. And so I'm using another base image. I don't have an as here because there's no need because you only really need an as if someone after you is going to use mm. you. And in this case, there's, there's no one yeah. else. This is only a two-stage yeah, one. Yeah, but this second one is, is in the copyrights referencing that build environment yes. from the from the parameter. E exactly. Cool. So you, you, you followed the, the syntax. Yeah, I've never seen this before, but here yeah. it's simple enough. Yeah, so you're saying from this other guy, the first one, Please grab this directory from that first image, mm -hmm. and then copy it to the to yeah, the working to the directory, there. Yeah. and um, and then let's go. So, oh. all I'm going to show you is um, actually we can just do it right here because one of the cool things about Docker. Oh no, I need to. Never mind. Uh, you need to get to where your source yes, is. Yes, sorry. So, yeah. yeah. I, uh, That's the one trick you still have to follow. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me just see, just make sure. I'm, yeah, I tried it on this machine. So um, actually, we, we did um, Windows before. Mm -hmm. 
How about, this is probably a really bad idea for um, oh, demoing. You, oh, you mean something you didn't prepare to demo and you're just like, oh, I'm just going to demo it. Yeah, let's, yeah. Just, let's go. Why yeah. not? This is Toolbox. Uh, this isn't uh, oh, I think built it, Keynote. You should be all right. Okay, I think it worked. So let's do... <laughs> Famous last words, Richard. Yeah, Docker build minus T. We'll say Toolbox demo and then dot. So it means I'm going to pick up the dot. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. So that's... I was about to I say, I typed, in, I typed an awesome command line. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to go into prod. That's the one I think we were looking at. Yeah. So docker build mi uh, minus t toolbox demo dot. And so, oh, it's, I ran this before. Um, here. Um, okay. Well, it was really fast. I, I'm not going to undo the fact that I ran this before. Mm -hmm. It actually, dem uh, maybe this is a good demo actually. Mm -hmm. It demonstrates that. Um, the Docker tools are really smart. So when, there's, when it's already done the work. Yeah, and no changes, I guess. Yeah, it knows that there are no changes. Yeah. So it's like, I'm, I'm good. Cool. So, but then we can, whatever that's spelled. Um, so that, th that was an awesome command if that existed. I was yeah. like, what is it doing? Uh, I think it was toolbox demo. Is that yeah, what we called it? Yeah, toolbox demo, I believe. And so that, that, that was pretty fast. This, is, mm -hmm. I guess, actually has .NET Core 1.1 in it. Yeah, although that it's running doesn't, on Linux, which doesn't is really awesome. matter. Um, and I'd say that startup time was, was pretty good. We're booting up a, a Linux container mm -hmm. on Windows, and then we're booting up .NET Core uh, inside that container and running this app. And in case you can't tell what this is, this is our, our friend .NET Bot saying, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, love, I love this thing. This thing welcome cool. to using .NET Core. Cool. Um, cool. Was there anything else we were going to show? Well, or? we wanted to talk about .NET Standard, but I, I think, I think we've, we've covered a lot today. Okay. So I'd love to have you or Emo or somebody come back, and, and I think we can do a whole show just on that. I think so. And we we um, still need to deliver the .NET Standard message to a lot of folks and clarify things, and as it evolves too, who knows. But uh, I think this has been a good set of demos. Awesome. I love this. All right. Well, thank you so much, Richard. I think our audience there appreciates it, and we want to thank you for being in Toolbox, and thank you folks for watching. If you have questions, please uh, post, uh, post the questions down the thread, and we'll make sure all the links that we showed you are available, and please come back to the next episode of Toolbox. Thank you very much. Thank you.